Good evening, I'm David Brinkley and welcome to the 6 o'clock news. No, actually, welcome to Orthodoxy Q&A. Um, we've got two more sessions. We have two more sessions of a, a pre-recorded session because we didn't want you guys to miss out. But we will be returning to our live stream of Orthodoxy Q&A on 8 August. So, uh, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, we've got a couple of more questions. You guys were really good about sending in some questions, some really interesting questions, as you probably saw through uh, uh, last week and the previous week's questions. But let's get into today's questions. All right. Marcelo asks... Uh, so, a little bit long reading here, but stay with me. According to Orthodox Christian theology, what happens to the soul of a person immediately after death and throughout the various stages leading up to the second judgment? Could you explain the journey of the soul, including the, in, the immediate post-death experience, third, ninth, fortieth day, and the period up to judgment and final second judgment? How are these stages understood in the teachings of the Church Fathers and reflected in liturgical practices and traditions of the Orthodox Church? Let's stop right there. Okay, so first off, no, I cannot explain to you what are the stages, various stages of death leading up to the, to the Second Judgment. Why? Because nobody has ever come back from the dead to tell us what that is. Now, we have a lot of the Fathers telling us different things. And most people of today have kind of gathered around Father Seraphim Rose's book, uh, Life After Death, okay, where he talks about specific things that will happen and in that he includes the toll houses, all right? None of this is orthodox dogma or doctrine. We have some speculations about what we think, but to tell you what are the various stages, the answer is I can't tell you. Nobody can tell you because nobody has, other than Jesus Christ, has returned from the dead and he did not provide us that information. All right. What I can tell you is that what is important to us as Orthodox are those memorial services that are done after death. So the first one that is done at the time of death, three days, nine days, 40 days, and then one year, and then whatever other years the family wants to celebrate. So the idea is, is that for the first nine days, the soul is given a foretaste of, of both hell, punishment, and of heaven, reward. And then the soul is put into a place of sleep until the second coming. Other than that, I really can't tell you uh, anything more. That's the speculation that we have. But uh, the Orthodox Church, um, the, what I want to say, the, the general Orthodox position is that a lot of what Father Seraphim Rose says is interesting, but is not considered to be dogma. All right. Um, and as far as liturgical practices go, you know that, and if you've been watching any of our live streams, you've seen almost every Sunday we have a, some kind of memorial service. Now, we always make sure that we have a 40-day memorial service, all right? The, not, the three and the nine day are typically done at the grave site itself, but the 40 days is done in the church with the boiled wheat, the koliva that, uh, that we have. At the, cemetery, at the cemetery, typically what they'll have there is just the boiled wheat without the powder sugar, which is then sitari. All right? So that's how we see that in the liturgical practices. Oh, and we also have the Saturday of Soul services where the parishioners will submit their names that they want remembered for those who have passed away. And we'll have typically four of those Saturday of Souls or Psychosavata throughout the year. So for the second part of the question, what intercessory acts can the living perform for the departed, such as prayers, am giving memorial services, and what is their theological basis and efficacy? All right, I kind of already answered that a little bit, that we do have the 40-day memorial services and then also memor other memorial services that the, that the family would like to do, plus we have the Psychosavata or the Saturday of Soul services. So that's something that, that the that uh, a, a loved one can do or the family can do for their loved one uh, within a liturgical setting or at the cemetery, all right? 
Now, what is their theological basis? All right. So the theological basis for that is in the book of Maccabees, I believe in the third book of Maccabees, which is considered, um, at least within Protestantism, uh, to be an apocryphal book. But in that, we do have references. Um, we do we do have a reference where it where it talks about uh, do you see these do you uh, do you see these bones and I can make and God talks about how I can make these bones then flesh and so there are prayers that are said for the for the dead it's an appeal made to God and then he puts flesh onto those bones so there is a biblical basis for this okay as far as a liturgical basis for this we know that in apostolic times uh, it, the as even within the time of the apostles, that they would have prayers done and services done at the catacombs, and uh, at, sorry, at the catacombs uh, where their saints were buried or family members were buried. And many times we know that they would have memorial services also, and that's recorded there. All right. How do these practices embody the orthodox understanding of the communion of saints and the ongoing relation between the living and the dead? Well, you've, you've said it right there. So we believe, uh, and unlike, unlike uh, Protestantism, we believe that we are not just a body of Christ in the living, the church militant as we refer to us, we who are living, but also we celebrate with the church triumphant. Those are, those are the people that have passed away. This is great saints of the church, the martyrs, the confessors, the monks, all of those participate together with us during our liturgical services. And so, so even to the point that the angels themselves uh, um, uh, is our orthodox belief that during the small entrance, okay, when I come out with the gospel, that we are attended by the, uh, by the, um, uh, the hosts of angels. So, so yes, we do have a very organic relationship between we who are alive, fighting and suffering, militant, and those who have received then or will receive their rewards. All right. Uh, Panayoti Christo asks, does watching Sunday Mass count as church? Uh, we're kind of 50-50 here because remember uh, what you've probably heard me say uh, in earlier questions Worship, when people say, well, church is boring, that's why I don't go, it's repetitive, because they don't understand the basis of worship. Worship means that I do something for God. When you talk about, about repetitive or boring, then it's all about you. I'm not getting anything out of it, and that's a very selfish way to think. Worship is what you offer then to God. We hear it in the liturgy. We offer to you thy, thy gifts of thine own gifts. And part of what we offer is our time, that we come to his house. All right. So in that sense, it doesn't count, because you are not making the investment of your time. All right. Having said that, I understand that sometimes it's difficult. You're sick, uh, something's happened, you've had to stay late at work, and so you didn't get up, you know. Uh, so if there's extenuating circumstances, then yes, watching a live stream, okay, can count, because you're at least you're making the effort, okay, to, to be involved and use that hour and a half for virtuous things, like watching a liturgy, versus things of vice, you know, which is just being lazy, sleeping, watching television programs you shouldn't happen, surfing the internet, whatever. Okay, so it's kind of a yes and a no answer to that. All right, so Isaac Acro asks, I have a question regarding the unforgivable sin. I'm 70% sure I've committed it. Am I doomed? So before we continue, Let's look at the unforgivable sin. Now, this occurs in several of the Gospels, but I'm going to read specifically out of, out of Matthew here. All right. And we're going to look here at Matthew 12, and I'm going to read 31 through uh, 32. All right. Just so we get the full context. Jesus speaking. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. 
anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. So there's the unforgivable sin. All right, so let's go ahead and answer that. So if we look, in, and this is again the Orthodox Study Bible, if we look at the notes, the notes are, the notes are very clear, okay? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is blasphemy against the divine activity of the Spirit and against goodness, okay? So, he, so they explain, a sin against the Son of Man is more easily forgiven because the Jews did not know about Christ. So it's one of ignorance. But blasphemy against the Spirit, whose divine activity they recognized from the Old Testament, they knew the Spirit of God, okay, will not be, will not be forgiven because of its willful hardness of heart and a refusal to accept God's mercy. So that's why, that, that's why you know, Jesus, at least from our Orthodox perspective, that's why Jesus says this. Now, the fathers of the church are clear that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not an unforgivable sin, for St. John Chrysostom teaches that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is forgiven if the person repents from it. So this is where we have the, this is where we have the difference. Somebody that remains in that condition and blasphemes against the Holy Spirit and stays in that, yes, that's the unforgiven sin, okay? And just like we had, you know, with the Pharisees and the Jewish elders, that they remained in their hardness of heart. That's why he's saying it's not gonna be forgiven. So we just wanna make that clarification there. All right, so am I doomed? No, you're not. Of course, I'm assuming now uh, that, that uh, because you are worried about this, that you would repent of that, okay? So I don't sense a hardness of heart in the question, but again, uh, so assuming that, then yes, you're not do you, no, you are not doomed. Secondly, this past Sunday, I accompanied my mother to her church, and the pastor was preaching his message, I fell asleep in the benches. And, okay, and again, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes priests and pastors are not the most exciting people, so I understand that, all right? During this time, my mother kept twisting my arm to keep me awake. I was personally out of this world, half conscious, so I, I think I assumed it was some type of bug, and I, uh, and I strike myself in the arm thinking it was a bug, but it was my mother. But another part of me is telling me I did that on purpose. I can't quite remember. Did I commit a sin? All right. So no, it's not a it's not a sin to fall asleep. That's more that's more indicative of of the fact that maybe the maybe the pastor needs to be a little bit more energetic. I know sometimes we're not as energetic as we should be, and that should be a message. Trust me, I've looked out many many times. Or I shouldn't say many times. Boy, that's that's terrible. Uh, but I've looked out, you know, and, and I've every once in a while I'll, I'll see somebody sleeping there, and it immediately tells me that I need to change my direction. Okay, so sometimes it's a it, it's a hint for the uh, for the priest. All right. But, you know, hitting, hitting your mom, all right, hitting anybody, okay, and especially in church. So th if there's any sin there, that's where the sin would lie. So, so this is something, obviously, that you should, uh, you should apologize for. If you do think that there's some kind of unconscious sediment in there that you were getting back at your mom because of the fact that she's picking on you for that, okay, then you've got to work that out. All right. We've got user duo 3 ro Someone please tell me where in the Bible it is written to make the sign of the cross with your hand. If it is not the word of God, it is therefore manufactured and thus useless. All right. So now I'm going to quote out of, out of the catechism book. So, uh, it, so that's, that's partly I did it for myself also so I'd have easy access to the information. So first off, you know, we have to speak about the tradition of the church. So, um, so user duo is correct. Someone please tell me where in the Bible is written to make the sign of the cross. It is not written in the Bible. This is an activity, this is a tradition that the apostles brought forth and the Holy Fathers carried, all right? So, um, give me just one second here. All right, so let's talk about holy tradition first, all right? Okay, Protestants claim sola scriptura, meaning that only that which is specified in the Bible 
or in scripture is valid as a liturgical or a worshipful act, all right? The Orthodox Church disagrees with that, okay? Because what we have here is St. Paul himself speaking to the Thess Thessalonians in, uh, in, in chapter 2, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold the paradosi, the traditions that were passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. So what the Protestant church is saying is, well, the only thing we have is the letters. But that's not what St. Paul told us. St. Paul told us that you will keep the traditions if whether I pass them by word of mouth or by letter, which obviously then became scripture. Okay, so we do, as the Orthodox Church, as the Catholic Church, believe that holy tradition is part and parcel of our, part, of, part and parcel of our Christian faith, not just scripture. Okay, so where did the sign of the cross come from then? If it didn't come from Scripture, then where did it come? Okay. So, early Christians made the sign of the cross with the right hand across the forehead. Very similar to what you see being done on Ash Wednesday by the Catholics, where the priest will do, then make the sign of the cross on the forehead with the ash. So this is the oldest reference that we have to making the sign of the cross. Okay. And the majority of the patristic fathers, both East and West, express the importance of Christians visibly making the sign of the cross, which is the power of the cross. And I'm just quoting by one of them, Tertullian. In all of our travels, all of our movements, all of our comings and goings out, at bath, at the table, putting on our shoes, lighting a candle, lying down, sitting down, whatever employment occupies us, let us mark our foreheads with the sign of the cross. So we have this from apostolic times as a tradition. Alex, Alex Zot, I'm just going with, or it's, or it's Alexo T, one of the two. Uh, in response to our, our video on Orthodox, uh, Orthodox icons, what is the difference between veneration and worship? Okay, so worship is that which is due to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So worship is reserved only for the one God expressed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Trinity. Veneration is more respect for those people who have lived a life in Christ, all right? So when we see an icon, we, it's always a depiction of either a person, a saint, or an event of the church, which certainly then involves people. For example, ours, the Annunciation, involves the angel Gabriel and then the Theotokos, all right? So in this case, we're not worshiping the angel Gabriel, we're not worshiping the Virgin Mary. Today, we didn't worship the icon of Saints Peter and Paul, but we did do is we honored the memory of what Saints Peter and Paul did for us and what they did for Christ and how they serve as an example to us. So veneration is the respect that we pay by wanting to copy their actions. But worship is reserved for the triune God. All right, David W. asks in response to our vestment series, amazing vestments, who makes them? A monastery? Uh, monasteries, some monasteries may make vestments, but most of the time uh, there are commercial, uh, uh, commercial outfits um, and when I say commercial outfits, I mean there is usually a seamstress or a tailor, and they have experience in certainly tailoring, but also specific skill sets in making vestments. All of the vestments that I have were made commercially, meaning that they were made by someone who was, uh, who was not, uh, not clergy uh, or not a monastic. So, and, and that's where most of the vestments uh, do come from, by somebody who is trained, a lay person that is trained in the art of making vestments. In response to our shorts about confession, uh, Irving Ortolazo, Irving Ortolazo says, confess to God only. Priests can't forgive anything, only God can. And again, a similar question from Leah Michael, as long as we confess to God, we do not have to confess to another person, all right? 
So what I'm reading out of is the priest service book. Okay. And in the priest service book, under the sacrament of confession, during the time of absolution, the prayer reads as such. My spiritual child, who has confessed to my humble person, I, humble and a sinner, have no power on earth to forgive sins, but only God alone can forgive sins. But through that divinely spoken word which came to the apostles after the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who said, whose ever sins you remit, they are remitted, whose ever sins you retain, they are retained, we are emboldened to say that what you have, what, whatever you have said to me, a humble person, whatever you failed to say, may, you be, may God forgive you in this world and the world to come. So it is scripturally based. Jesus Christ did give the power to forgive sins to his disciples. And through apostolic succession, we priests today and bishops then do inherit that right that was given to his apostles, was given to the apostles of Jesus Christ. So um, when you say read your Bible, I have to bring that back and I have to say yes, but you do need to read the Bible. Uh, a closing statement on that, as long as we confess to God, we do not confess to another person. In the Protestant, and especially in the non-denominational churches, the accountability partner has become very, very common. And what is that in reality? It's somebody that you are confessing to and that you have become accountable to. So now we're just playing words here, all right? Because an accountability partner is disguised words for a father confessor. Okay, the priest, the person doesn't have to be a priest, but you are confessing your sins to somebody else. Why would you do that? You're doing it because the Protestant church understands that you have to be accountable to somebody, all right? If you're trying to break the habit of, of smoking or drinking, let's say, and you confess only to God, you go in your corner and you say, God, please forgive me. I, I want to quit smoking. I know that's bad. I want to quit drinking because I get drunk all the time. All right. And then you have nobody to be accountable to except for yourself. The demons and Satan attack you again. And so there you are doing it and you're coming back next week. And now you're asking for forgiveness again. You're not getting anywhere. All right, so the bottom line here is that you need to be accountable to somebody. The Protestant church has recognized that need, especially the non-denominational churches. And so what we're saying is, is here the accountability partner is clergy who is trained in, counsel, in the arts of counseling. Milo James says, can't you just call it orthodoxy or maybe Eastern orthodoxy the ethnic ghetto mentality of some in the GOA is ridiculous. And Storm Shadow says, I got to say, the Greek Orthodox and other ethnic Orthodox have to be more accepting of other cultures here in the United States. Stressing your home ethnicity isn't good for church growth. Take a lesson from the OCA. In my last parish, when we built the church, there was a group of people that said, don't put Greek on the church because it's going to take people away and people are not going to want to come. Let's just call it the Orthodox Church. And I have vehemently said, no, it is the Greek Orthodox Church. All right. So, you know, can we get crazy with our ethnicity? Yes, we can. I mean, uh, President Pitera has, has experienced time and time again this, uh, this idea of, you're not Greek, I make you Greek. I make you Greek. Everything Greek, Greek, Greek. Okay, I get it. We can get carried away with this, all right? But we can't put that on the church. As our bishop is very fond of saying, it is that title that helps you to understand the type of liturgy that you will see, okay? A Byzantine style or a Greek style divine liturgy has certain elements to it that make it unique to the Byzantine culture. The Slavs, the Slavic culture, the Russians, um, the, uh, the Ukrainians, they have a particular uh, Russian style that is unique to them. The Romanians, they also have a style. So when you see Romanian Orthodox Church, Slavic Orthodox or Russian Orthodox Church or Greek Orthodox Church, what do you see? You see or, or you know 
what type of liturgy you're going to get. Of course you're going to get the St. John Chrysostom liturgy, but those little ethnic differences are very interesting and very unique to the country that it came from. I agree with you. We got to get off of our, our, ethnic, our, our ethnic high horse and think that we're the greatest. But that is not reason enough to say, let's just get rid of everything. Again, that can become a very Protestant mentality, a very Western idea of get rid of everything that is non-essential so we become a totally utilitarian church. And that in no way is who the Orthodox Church is. Jim Billy Ray Bob, I like that name in response to our holy altar video, says, what is the altar? Well, the altar is actually two things. Because remember, there is a connection with our Jewish heritage for Christianity, all right? So there is an Old Testament symbolism and there is a New Testament of symbolism, a fullness that has come through the New Testament. So from an Old Testament perspective, what we have is we have the table of we have the, the, the table of sacrifice, okay? But, and ver or very similar to what we had, to what the Jews had. But this is the table of the final sacrifice. And that's what you hear in the litur liturgical prayers, is this is the final, uh, uh, the end sacrifice. Jesus Christ himself sacrificed himself. And so each Sunday, through a little resurrection, Christ, we're offering the sacrifice that Christ made for us. So in that sense, it connects us to our Jewish heritage that this is the table of sacrifice. But in the, in the New Testament, what we have is we have the, the reenactment of the Last Supper. Jesus Christ sitting with his apostles and instituting the idea of a Eucharistic meal. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me, and drink of this all of you. So the altar table actually has both an Old Testament connotation and a New Testament connotation. David Braun asks, in response to confessions are private, is there a canon in the Orthodox Church forbidding divulging what is confessed by the penitent to the priest? I know there was a canon from 1215 regarding strict confidentiality of confession to priests among the Latins. And also... Uh, the Joshua Project says, uh, what did he mean by that, but that doesn't happen today, so it happened before? So the answer to the question is, is that what is said under the veil of confession must remain private, okay? So I cannot divulge that information. So for example, if somebody comes to me and says, I murdered my brother, I murdered my friend, okay? I can't divulge that because number one, I don't know if, some, if he's bragging or if he actually did it. So I don't have proof that that actually occurred. Uh, obviously, I need, to, I need to take that further, you know, and I need to ask a few more questions and all that. And I also have a responsibility that if he did it, that he or she, okay, should then turn themselves in to accept the consequences of their action. So it doesn't mean, it's like the, the mafia movie here where, where he comes and he confesses and then I say, oh, your sins are forgiven, off you go. No, there's a counseling, there's a therapeutic part of this. If he comes to me and he says some a, a evil crime, I, I, I robbed somebody, I murdered somebody, I stabbed somebody, all right, I can't just leave it at that. I've got to take that a little bit further. Okay, I'm not saying that I need to be their psychoanalyst, but what I do need to do is get them to understand that they need to be accountable for the consequences of their actions. I may or may not be successful, but I have that responsibility. So I know that those of you that, uh, that are Greek or grew up in a Greek household, you probably are not familiar with the sacrament of confession. I know that growing up, uh, confession was not part of our household. Okay, that's that's not something that uh, that I grew up with, and it's something that I learned uh, I learned about in seminary, and I learned the actual 
uh, idea and the theology behind the importance of confession. Now I'm all about it. I'm, I, I, I get it. I understand it. Okay, but I know that, uh, that a lot of Greeks did not necessarily understand it. The reason for that and where this comes from is that when I went to Mount Athos, there was a group of us, and at one of the monasteries at night, there was an older monk who sat with us. And so I asked the monk, I said, Father, I've got to know, you know, why is it that Greeks don't confess? And in his Greek accent, he said to me, you know, that, that in the old days, a lot of times in the villages, the priests weren't educated. They were good chanters. Uh, maybe they could memorize things, but they had no theological education. So he said <laughs> what happened is that the priest would hear a confession, and then unfortunately at the Cafaneo that night, after a few tsiparos or after a few uh, uh, um, uh, uzos, uh, he tend to uh, say more than he should have said, so people learn that they that the priest wasn't keeping the confidentiality. All of that is gone today. I'm talking about you know you know 50, 80, 100 years ago. Now all priests like myself are well educated in the dogma and theology of our church, and so we don't have that problem anymore. Confession is not something that should be should be feared. My last question comes from Henrietta, who asks, who is your favorite actor to portray Jesus on TV or film? And I've got an actor for each one, all right? On film, I prefer Max von Sydow in The Greatest Story Ever Told. But for TV, I think it's, uh, and I've got it, I wrote his name down because I could remember it, Jonathan Rumi in The Chosen, because I really think he did, a, uh, did an excellent job in that. So that's my, that's my picks for TV or film. Well, this concludes then our third pre-recorded session of Orthodoxy Q&A. So looking forward to seeing you all one more time for pre-recorded, and then after that, we're back to being live again. So have a great night, and we'll see you soon.